Hello and welcome to Emergent Soul Conversations, the podcast promoting self-love and awareness with the hopes of developing sisterhood and community. We will be discussing concepts that pull on the hearts of today's woman. I'm your host, Karen Elaine, and I will share my life experiences along with inviting others to sit down with me who inspire me and also have a willingness to share their soul's journey. This podcast will give us meaningful and intimate conversations that will help us create a life by design and not default. If this is your first time listening in, I thank you. Now on till today's episode. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Emergent Soul, a conversation with author Karen Aline. Good evening, Karen. How are you tonight? I'm fine, Mark. Thank you for uh, setting this platform for me this evening. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. (laughs) You know, it's an absolute pleasure. You know how I feel about this work. I have been aware of this work for some time and was absolutely thrilled that you decided to republish it. I'd first like to let the audience know where we are. We are in the Soul Adventures global community on Clubhouse. Karen is the first author to grace this club um, with her presence and with her presentation of her book. And I am calling in or dialing in from Costa Rica, San Jose, Costa Rica. And Karen, where are you tonight? I am in Lake Worth, Florida. All right. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, I'm not going to delay in, in getting to uh, the heart of this amazing book. I'd like to read a little bit from the, the foreword. I can't say it any better um, what Dr. Vicki Carr has said. Um, this book, Emergent Soul, Rising from Life's Darkest Moments, is long overdue. Believe it or not, our trials, trauma, and those unexpected painful moments that take our breath away, develop strengths we did not know we had. Perhaps a better way to say it is that these fire moments make us aware of the strength we had all the time. Karen is no stranger to dark moments. What I've grown to love about her over the years are her candor and generous spirit. Whether she is speaking to an audience from the stage or sharing her testimony in an intimate setting one-on-one, she is a living, breathing lighthouse for others to find their way through the dark. Karen openly shares the details of her suffering, but more importantly, provides tools to help others emerge a more powerful person as she has done. Life has not been easy for Karen, Nevertheless, she has demonstrated that we can turn lemons into lemonade, pain into power, tragedy into triumph, and catastrophic illness into a life's calling. Maybe you're not sick or haven't experienced tragedy or have had little experience with pain in your life up to this point. Guess what? You should read this book anyway and then share it with someone else that needs hope. Why? When one soul emerges victorious from the depth of hopelessness and shares that journey, it makes the world a better place. My friend Karen is the embodiment of the call for emergent souls to rise, heal your life, and live in the light. That is the forward from Dr. Vicki Johnson, a chaplain, speaker, author, and creator of Soul Wealth. And like I said, I couldn't say it any better, Karen. Um, And so I welcome you to the Soul Adventures global community. There are many um, accolades that go with your name and you play play many roles and wear many um, hats as an an author, as a realtor. Um, You acquired your MBA from Clark Atlanta University um, in marketing and, you know, roles that the world recognizes, um, you've played many of them, continue to play them. But in this context, we're celebrating your role as an author. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Karen Aline and have you tell us about yourself in your own words. 
Uh, well, well, thank you very much. And and if you know me and uh, a lot of some of the people who are here know me and some don't, but I tend to shy away from titles, if that makes sense, because I mean, we can call ourselves anything, you know, in my opinion, but I think it's more so of what of how we show up and being of service to others. So I always try to focus on on that aspect of it versus saying that I am this, I'm this person, but that's how the world is. So yes, I am a speaker, I am an author, a, a mother, uh, and I have um, experienced many things in this lifetime that has given me a a broad perspective of, of, of how to live and how to view things. Um, life isn't perfect and no one is. And I just try to remember. Um, and one of the main focal points of the book is that, you know, what happens to you doesn't define who you are. And it's those moments, those dark moments and how you respond in those times is, I think helps create the person who, who we become if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Um, Karen, what, you know, what I really appreciate about this book is that um, you do not obscure your process. You, you kind of describe the stages that one can go towards becoming an emergent soul in three steps. The first being the trial phase, the second being the release phase, and the third being uh, the new life phase. And I love that this process is not obscured. And since I have read the book, I've been asking myself, you know, what phase am I in uh, with respect to, you know, any given situation in, in my present life? Um, and I'm really curious about your decision to write this book. A lot of people go through trials and maybe they triumph over them. But they don't always look back and, and wonder, you know, as the old song goes, how their soul got over. So I would just like you to share with um, the listeners here tonight what compelled you really um, to not only write Emergent Soul, but also to give it another go and to republish it in 2022. Well, that, that's a great question, Mark. And um, Emergent Soul was birthed. Uh, originally in, in 2015, even before it was, it was a book. And I always say that Emergent Soul is, is a movement. And it's my belief that um, one of the most difficult things uh, in life that I went through was uh, when my son Kenneth uh, passed away as an infant. Uh, and then a month afterwards, my uh, first husband um, moved on, I'll say it that way. <laughs> And I was left with uh, my oldest son, Christopher, who was two at the time to raise. And that was a very trying time, as you could imagine. Um, and it, it was very difficult. I'm not going to say it wasn't a very difficult time, a very difficult time to process, as well as, you know, moving forward in a new identity of being a single mom with a son to raise um, and not really understanding or knowing what any of that was. And so... As I got older, I, I, I remarried, I had more children and, and you know, went through life. Um, and I'll say it functioning, you know, not really being present, if that makes sense. Um, I was diagnosed uh, later on, be, you know, being clinically depressed, but I was a, a functioning person, if that made sense, because I had to. I had to, you know, in, in my, I'll say it this way, I guess you don't have to do anything, but as a mother having three kids, you know, as a working mother, you know, as a part provider, it was my choice at that time saying, okay, this is what I had to do. So I was functioning in the have to do moment and I put myself on the back burner. And so by putting myself on the back burner, I didn't deal. And that's how I processed, you know, going through my twenties, my thirties up until, you know, I was 40. I didn't know who Karen was. Karen, it didn't matter. Everything was for my kids, my household and everything. In it. So it wasn't until I turned 40 where I realized that I could say no and no is a sentence. <laughs> and I realized that I had lost my identity so much that it was so important that I had to find out and reclaim what was lost. And so in that time frame, I actually started doing a lot of personal development, going to conferences, doing to, you know, different events to focus on, 
on self and my identity and purpose. And it wasn't, you know, it was in 2015, you know, I was at a conference and I was like, oh my God, it's, it's emergent soul. What is emergent soul? And all I remember is I kept saying to myself, well, emergent is the process of a coming into being and soul gives life to the body. And this is what, that was my calling. It was my purpose. I didn't know what it was or how it was going to un unfold, but it was emergent soul. And I decided to have a conference. I had never put on a conference before in my life. And i held a three-day conference and just all that process going for, forward. And it was a matter of saying, you know, what happens doesn't define who you are and it's sharing your story because as we share other people, it brings people together. And I just knew that what, what binds and bonds people, it could be, you know, there are 10 people in this room right now. If we were in an auditorium of 50 people or a hundred people, the one thing that could connect all of us, even if we didn't know it, know each other, was loss. It's a connection. There's people in the audience who have lost their job. Maybe they've lost a loved one, uh, you know, lost a child, a parent, divorced. One of those things is going to connect all of us, even without knowing. But until you share those story and those processes, you're not going to know it. So I just knew that that was the emergent soul, and it was something that it was part of my process that I had to do it. And so I just started moving up and moving through the moments of that. And, and if you don't mind, I'd like to read the message to the reader, which is the opening part of the book, because I think it sums it up of how, how and why, and even now why it's more important for me to come back and bring it forward based on what's going on in the world. But the message to the reader in the book, it goes like this. It says, for a woman of my age, I've experienced numerous losses for a lifetime. Losses that paralyzed me and even made me want to give up. But there was always something inside of me telling me that giving up was never an issue and that I needed and had to fulfill a purpose. And I know that you may feel the same way, but I want you to know that you are needed and you're not alone. Your past is the greatest teacher. You should choose to remember it, but not relive it. I have learned through my experiences that I am strong, resilient, persistent, and alive because I chose to laugh, to love, to cry, and to have faith in people again. And it's not possible to create what you once had, but you must believe that you're creating what you want for your future. A wise man once said, you can't keep looking in the rearview mirror to move forward. You must look ahead. I used to look back and re-examine the past all the time, and it wasn't until I received the gift of hope that I was able to move forward. For me, Emergent Soul was a gift, and it taught me that life is a journey and not a destination. Emergent Soul is based on the premise that what connects all of us is a life-altering experience, and good things can come from those experiences. When you share your experiences, you open yourself up to the possibilities and inspire others to do the same. However, those experiences do not define who you are. You are more than an isolated moment in time. You are meant to live a full and abundant life, a life that is filled with love, joy, and more. But that only happens when you live deeply through all your experiences, not just the ones you could have done without. And as we let go of the past and begin telling another story, the story of how we want to live our lives, we begin operating at a higher energy level. And it is then when we can manifest our heart's needs, wants, and desires. This book simply provides the steps, some thought-provoking exercises and short stories that will allow you to help create the life that you desire so that you can begin telling yourself a new story. We all keep emerging daily. The journeys in our life, not the destinations, will help you embrace your emergent soul. Never give up and remember it's you and only you who can create your life's desire. Spend time living rather than reliving your life's darkest moments. Get caught up in the living. Emergent soul is a sure way to get there and it's your gateway for emerging into a new life filled with possibilities, a more abundant life. You're not alone. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, for those of us who know your voice, either from your podcast or um, working with you directly, they will recognize your voice on every page of this book. 
Um, and what is really remarkable, I don't think I've ever highlighted a book so much, but there, <laughs> <laughs> there are so many gems um, on from, from one page to the next. I've always thought of you as a, a unifier of people. And there's one quote that really um, stood out to me. And it's, as we reach out to one another and band together, we create a community of like-minded caregivers of the universe, willing to carry each other as far as is needed. And I think I was particularly struck by that quote because sometimes in our own darkness, we feel like we're the only ones going Mm -hmm. um, through a certain situation. And it's precisely at those times that we find that we need one another. We need people who are maybe are a little bit further along in the journey. Um, and we need those people who are willing to, as you say, carry others. Um, and th there's a delicate balance there because those who are willing to carry others are also those who also maybe tend to sacrifice themselves a little bit too much. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a, that's a delicate balance um, that would be interesting for you to, to speak to, I think, because I know a lot of us uh, who are very empathic find ourselves sacrificing our needs and our desires. And that, that's a very true, true statement. And I can say that I've lived there in the past. <laughs> And as we, uh, you had asked me question earlier as far as why did I decide to republish? And I, first of all, I republished because I realized um, this year that there were chapters in the book that were, were missed for somehow, but everything happens for a reason. So it gave me an opportunity to redo this. But also, it also gave me an opportunity to look back at the work through new lenses because where I was uh, in 19, excuse me, in 2018 and where I sit today in 2022 are two different places and my perspective is, is very different now than it was then. So when I wrote this book originally, I was really in the trials, the trial phase. Everything was still fresh. I mean, I had moved on where I could talk about things without it making me cry. For me, that's, a, that's my test point. Can I share my story regarding my son passing away you know, getting divorced, getting breast cancer and all these things without it breaking me. You know, when, you know, when a scab is, is new, if you pick at it, it's going to, you know, it's, it's going to, you know, ex you'll express everything, you know, but can I share, if I can ex share those things that have, you know, taken me to my core without it breaking me and still feel it, then I'm in a better place. So when I originally wrote the, wrote the book, the things that I wrote about, I had, you know, the feeling is still there, but I could tell the story or share the story without it taking me to my knees. Today, when I go back and read those same things, yes, I, I'm further away from breaking and more feelings, but I even look at it and say, boy, I, I could have, today where I am sitting now, where I'm further ahead, I could tell it a different way where it's still impactful, still meaningful, but I would share the story in this way. So that's all about growth maturity and everything else. Another thing, you know, so that's the first thing. The second thing as far as being caring people and being the caretaker. Yes, I'm very much, I care what happens to people. And I still know that we each have our own journey. My journey is not theirs and it's not my job to carry them through their journey. However, if I'm further along in the journey and I have experienced things that can help somebody else get through their darkness and their journey, then I feel it's my duty to share that information. However, I know that the most, the number one person that I have to take care of in this lifetime and have to make myself a priority is myself. Just, and it's, and it's, it's not, you know, some people say, well, that's selfish. And I say it's not because even if we get biblical, Jesus, he broke away from his disciples and apostles, and he went to feed himself with the word to get himself strong. So follow him by examples. If we don't put ourselves on the list, if we're always caring others and not taking the time to feed ourselves, then there's what's going to be left. It's not going to be your best, 
You know what I'm saying? So I had to learn. And as I've come through through things where before I said that in the first 20, you know, 20 years, I had lost my identity and everything, everything financial, physical, spiritual, emotional was giving to somebody else. I had allowed myself to be so broken and functioning, but there's, I was a shell. I was a functioning shell. And so I had to learn to say, Karen, you have to put yourself first. You have to make yourself a priority. You have to feed your spirit because there is nothing less. And my job is my first priority has to be to myself. And so I try to live myself that way in the sense that I'm in a lot of organizations. I'm a lot of group. I have friends, but Karen has to be a priority because if I have nothing, if I don't give to myself, I can't give to somebody else. So that's one of the biggest things that I've learned where I, I will share what I've gone through, but I can't take it on. And there's an empath. I'm like, nope, nope. Check in Karen. Is that yours feelings? Or are you feeling for somebody else? Step back. You can express yourself, but you have to make sure that you are okay. And so even with my kids, everything else, no longer will I give to where it's a detriment. And that's a part of the growth where I had done things like that before, where I've done, taken action that was harmful to myself, physical, financial, you know, to give to somebody else. And you just, you can't survive that way. And it's not a good way to live. Thank you, Karen. And I think uh, one of those highlighted quotes of among, among many that I absolutely love is, if you truly love yourself and f- feel fulfilled with who you are, then you would never entertain the thought of sacrificing your happiness for another person. Uh, mm-hmm. That that really, for me, um, kind of sums it up. And it's it's not selfish at mm-hmm. all. It's, it speaks to self-preservation and allowing oneself to be available to others. Right. And that was, that was one of, so post book (laughs) and post moving forward, you know, I had to learn that. And that was a very needed lesson to learn for my survival and everything else, as well as happiness and peace. And once you have happiness and internal peace, you won't allow anyone else. And it's, I I, want to rephrase that. You won't allow yourself to break yourself down because the value has to be there for yourself and you have to get it from yourself and not from another person. So a new change in life has gotten me where I am now, where I realize that and I know that. And I think it's important as as women, as moms, um, in marriages or not in marriages, you have to have that self value and worth and recognize it. So you're living your best life and really moving forward versus existing in life. And there is a difference. (laughs) Thank you. Um, One thing that I really value in this book is there are are a lot of healers emerging. And post-pandemic, you know, I imagine that we do need a a lot of healers to emerge. But there's something very different about this book in that you're not exploiting people who have been through trauma. There's even a quote where you explicitly say, this is not that kind of book. And I can tell you, I knew it wasn't that kind of book because every other page is not a link to your services. And and you yourself have said, this is just, this is not another self-help book trying to exploit people who have gone through traumatic experiences. Um, And I know, I know that kind of book they abound. You give so much freely <laughs> um, throughout this work. How how should it be used? I did read it start to finish in in the in the order that the chapters are written, which is rare for me. My time, my schedule doesn't always allow that. So I think I, like many others, we'll bounce around a book. We'll go to a chapter that resonates with us. Um, I found that I had the time this time to actually read the book start to finish and to work through quite a few of the exercises. But I did notice that if I wanted to, if I landed anywhere in this book, I would be served by something on the page. But I would like to know how how you recommend that it be read and, and used and worked with. Well, uh, well, that's a great question, Mark. And, and there is a companion piece uh, that will be released shortly with this book, 
which will help people go even deeper. Um, for me, I'm thinking Emergent Soul is going to be uh, similar to Chicken Soup for the Soul, but <laughs> Emergent Soul for the Soul <laughs> and different things. But, you know, I, I feel that if a person takes the time when they're reading the book, as well as making sure that they're spending time with the the Emergent Soul self-reflective exercises, it's going to actually help you in your own soul journey and see where you are. It's a good check-in to see where you are in each place. Um, I share my stories uh, or tidbits of the story in each chapter, not for you to so much or not for the reader so much to, to feel or find themselves in my story, but just as a way to help them go through the self-reflection, the, the areas of self-reflection and how I was in that phase is doing what I did and needed to either let go, release, reframe. But I think spending the time with the self-reflection exercises will help the reader identify where they are and to see if this is something that pertains to them, that needs to be changed, or even is there a story of their own that can share to help somebody else move to the next level to, you know, to where they're living life to the fullest and really um, recognizing the things that we do um, and why, even if you think it might be, a, you know, great, that it might be harmful, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Um, one thing that I really uh, value in this book is the journal exercises, the, the questions that you ask us to ask of ourselves are very, very powerful. And I know that that's one thing you really can't skim and, and race through. You might skim through the book, but you'd be doing yourself a great disservice to uh, skim through the journal exercises. Mm -hmm. and, and you yourself said, during a dark time in my life, I intuitively took a journal and wrote down how I felt about myself, what was going wrong. Uh, I know the power of journal, I'm a journal, journaling and journals. I'm a publisher of journals. Um, and journal, journaling is sacred space. So once you discover the journal, have, have, do you continue to this day to keep up with your journal practice? I, I actually do. And I have all of my journals, even from, and I think I started journal. I know I started journaling when I was in high school. Just, I don't know why I just did. And the other day I was looking through and I was like, oh, and I went back and read <laughs> some of my journal entries. But yes, I, it is a way to uh, express oneself uh, in a sacred space and in a space where you can share what's going without I don't want to say this. Um, you don't have you don't have to worry about it coming back to you. I'll say it that way. There are not all people, but there are some people who who we feel that our friends, our confidants, that you share things with. Um, and I hope you know who you can say something to, and you'll never hear it again. You know, hear it back again. But instead of having to worry about that, you can put it in your journal and move through one process and go to the next phase without it having to come back. Now, my journal, well, part of my journal, Emergent Soul, this book, Rising from Life's Darkest Movement, it was, it was my choice to share, you know, some of the sacred, some of the private moments of my life. Because as I said in the beginning, you know, and I feel it was my son, I feel it was Kenneth who placed Emergent Soul in my heart. Um, it's something that I had to do because I've had people say, wow, you didn't hold anything back. And I'm like, well, I really did. But, you know, some of the private moments that I've shared you know, I didn't feel any kind of way. It was like, you know what? I know this is something that people are going through. Me sharing and telling my story will help someone else know that they, it's not something unique to just Karen. And I, I too can, can, you know, get through this. I too can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I too can survive and become, it's just that moment. It's just when you're in the, in the throes of thing where you feel that you can't. So you do, but I think I, yes, to answer the question, I still journal. I think it's a great practice for people to my coaching clients. It's something that I recommend to them to do. And it's just a way of self-expression where you can just write. And I think it helps get to your higher self into a deep place where 
the words are going to come and what needs to be revealed will be revealed. I have found with journaling, whether you journal about the past or hopes for the future, that it, it anchors you in the now. Um, and the, the voice that can come through in the journal can be quite different from you know, your voice that, that faces others. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's a wonderfully private and sacred space. Um, it sometimes is not easy <laughs> to keep up with a journal practice, uh, mm -hmm. um, but it's the type of thing where you stop, when you stop doing it, you notice. You notice something within yourself kind of getting a little, let's say, congested um, after you start to hold on to things that you otherwise were releasing regularly. Um, so I, I think it's, it's very important for that release phase <laughs> for one to have that sacred and private space. And there's one thing that, since I've been publishing journals for about a year now, um, I'm always a little um, hurt when folks say, no, I don't keep a journal because when I was young, someone found my journal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more common, it's more common than you know. Um, well, you know, in this day and age, you can have a digital journal. I, I just recommend doing it. Um, and even if you've had this negative experience in the past, give it another try. Um, sometimes we can't let even a, a past violation as simple as someone finding your journal continue to um, prevent us from doing what, you know, is really very healing and, and very beneficial. Um, and Karen, I do look forward to the companion, the companion journal. I imagine there's a lot of stuff on the, cutting floor or things that you decided not to share in this particular first work um, that might find itself into a companion piece that also supports journaling. So thank you for, for, for mentioning that. Do you, do you have another, um, another passage prepared to read for us? Oh, I could, I surely could. Let's see. Um, here's this one. So, this is something, it's chapter 14, called Un Unapologetically. Uh, I want to read that one. I, I never I know what to read, Mark. Okay, let's see. Yes, all right. I will lead this. Okay, this is one that I will lead this. Releasing the Desire to Change Others. It's chapter five. And this one, the reason I'm going to read this one right now, um, I guess it's more prevalent to myself as having grown uh, adult children, I'll say it this way. I, I had to learn the lesson. There were some lessons that I'm learning now is number one, uh, and I share this with, with the audience is, don't do something for someone with anything attached to it. No attachment. So if you're gonna do something for someone, do it because you your heart wants you to do it, not that you're ever looking for something in return. And number two, recognizing that you cannot change someone you can't. It's the desire that they have to have for their own self to do that for them. So this is what this chapter was about, uh, kids and changing others. So uh, it says, I know we have all had the dream of changing others that are in our lives. And sometimes that dream of their change is extended. What I have learned is to receive or see change, you must be the change that you desire. This was one of the hardest journeys for me to learn on my path. And that sentence is still true to the day. <laughs> and I have to remind myself. So as parents and even friends, we at times have desires for how we want to be treated or even expected to be treated. As a mother, it never entered my mind that my child, my flesh and blood, would form a relationship with someone who would openly disre be disrespectful, verbally, and even physical. My oldest son chose to be in a relationship with a one young woman who did just that. I believe I was owed an apology for her disrespect, but it never came. This created a strain on my relationship with my son. I would not allow her to come to my home and I would not speak to her. I allowed this to go on for two years. The breaking straw was when we ended up in the same restaurant and were seated at neighboring tables. My son came over and spoke, but it felt very awkward. 
The following week, I was discussing what happened with a close friend, and she called me out on my behavior. She is very familiar with my emergent soul philosophy, but called me a hypocrite for acting as I did towards my son's girlfriend. I was taken aback, but she was right. Who was I to say that they owed me an apology? What did I know about her background? Perhaps she felt she didn't do anything wrong. The lesson for us all is we are wrong to have expectations of how people should behave. I'm not saying there is no right or wrong, but it is not right for us to judge others' actions or motives. I had passed judgment on this girl with the assumption she was intentionally being disrespectful to me. I included my son in that judgment because of his continued relationship with her. It still stings. I am not perfect, but I needed to be reminded that my own journey is not my son's. We all have our own lives lives to live and our own choices to make. The life and behavior we should be examining is our own and not everyone else's around us. We must all grow up. We just need the time to do so. If you want to avoid disappointment, don't place expectations on others as to how they should behave or respond. You can't control other people, but you can control what and who you will allow around you. What I have come to realize that the only person that has power over me and not just in my journey, but in everyone else's too. I am that person. We are all given our own path to walk and even though they may appear like others, their path is uniquely different. I wanted to apologize for any grief that I caused you in the past. My journey has taught me that we can't expect others to see or behave or how to think they should because of where they are in their path. I have come to understand that even through my son's choice to be in a relationship with someone who I felt was disrespectful to me, it's not my place or anyone else's place to judge their actions because we are focused on our journey and we can't see what's going on in others. This is one of the hard lessons that can be difficult to digest. However, as we accept the lesson and pass through our filters, we end up with a new understanding of how to treat others and what is expected from them. As you mature in your own journey, decide to release the desire to change others and be the change that you want to see in the world. And it ends with the quote, the world makes ways for the man who knows where he's going, James Allen. And, I, and I'll say, share this, everything happens for a reason. And I had an incident this week with my, my youngest daughter, my daughter, I have, I have two boys and a son. And it always brings me back that, okay, no matter how I look at it and how I look at it, because it's where I am in my life and my path. And I might think that she's being disrespectful and not purposeful purpose. You know, she's on her journey and I have to, I might not like it, but she's entitled to her thinking to the way that she wants to, you know, to act and respond. So even if I might lie, I'm like, okay, nope, I don't agree. But explain to me how you came to your think you know what i'm saying i'll ask more questions but it's always a good reminder that not my journey hers everyone or in, in general everyone's entitled to their own beliefs and you have to accept them i have a girlfriend who always says you have to accept someone and their the way they respond based on where they are not where you want them to be but where they are and accept them from where they are and so this is a daily reminder always just accept someone from where they are. Don't judge. Not right to judge. When you judge, you're actually judging yourself. But just remember, accept them from where they are. And I would say accept them um, where they are as, as you say in the book, as an emergent soul. Yes. Thank you. It looked <laughs> like, oh, I'm sorry. It looked like Courtney, um, excuse me, is, who's on the panel would like to say something. I don't know how to invite okay. the speaker, Mark, but. And if anyone has questions or wants to comment, please let us know. We will invite you up to speak if that's okay, Mark. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no worries. I'm going to invite Courtney up. And then I have just one more question of my own. And I know there are some wonderful questions in the audience. So then we're going to open up the, uh, the um, floor for others to okay. come on stage and speak. 
I, I just want to um, speak to what you call the most important chapter. And I, I tend to agree with you. <laughs> and it is the chapter, chapter 16, entitled The Power of Your Words. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. the reason why I'm in the publishing and writing business myself mm -hmm. is that I am keenly aware of what we call into being through yes. our words. So when I got to that chapter, I was just just overjoyed mm -hmm. um, for that acknowledgement and also a little a little sad. Karen, you really go there in this chapter and in no uncertain terms you say, this tradition of using words to kill must end. Mm. Yes. And that this is to this day, and that's why I always try to be careful with what I say and how I think it, because I truly believe words have power. And once you speak them, they go out into the universe <laughs> and manifest into what we speak, you know? And it's, it's not always what, and I had to learn, this is one of my lessons, and growing up in the Bahamas, you know, and you're, you grew up in Jamaica, one thing that culturally that we didn't do in the islands that, that people do do in the States is part of their culture, and I'm not trying not to judge that, but it's, it's the, your mama, those type of things. I didn't grow up with, with in that culture, <laughs> if that makes sense. And I had, in, in this day and age, toxic relationships exist. And there are some people, expect them where they are, it's what you, you have to learn to have a thick skin. But being an empath, being a, a cancer, being a water sign, you know, emotional being, as much as you try, you know, I try my best to say, okay, words don't hurt, you know, it's not physical. I don't believe that. I believe that emotional abuse is, can be, just as detrimental as physical abuse. And there are some who have mastered the technique um, of cutting people down to their core. Granted, it's our decision if we allow it to penetrate or not, but we're all human beings. And so we have to be mindful of the things that we say. We're so, we should, as a community, be speaking life into one another versus the opposite, if that makes sense. So it's that chapter is a reminder in, you know, everything that we do and who we are. And and Kenneth Copeland says it's not it's not what someone calls you, but it's what you respond to. So I had to start learning that just because somebody calls me something, it doesn't make it true. It only makes it true if I start calling it myself, calling it into myself or start acting as if it is true. In relationships, in marriages, in dealing with people, we have to start speaking life into each other. That's the only way that it's going to change. And you have to be that change that you wanna see. And that's something that, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't play the your mama games. You know, I'm not gonna go to try out and, you know, destroy somebody so it's, impacts them. I mean, mental illness is, is on the rise. I mean, think about the little boy who just killed himself from being bullying. Is this what we want to keep manifesting and keep going on? It, it has to stop. It really needs to stop. So I got sidetracked. <laughs> no, I know that you're, you're very, you're very passionate about that chapter. And I wanted to highlight it because it is a part of our culture. It's a part of our our comedy and, and what we see on television. We've learned to find what's really not funny. Um, we've, we've learned to somehow find humor in it. And it sticks, especially to the sensitive ones among us. Right. It really does stick. Um, I wanted to just in light of where we are, we are in um, the Soul Adventures Global Community discussing a book called Emergent Soul. Um, when I use the word soul, I am most often simply referring to our innermost being as, as deeply as you can fathom that. Um, that's what I'm generally referring to. And I know that quite often we do receive little nudges, little whispers, but we've learned to ignore it. We've learned to numb it. We've learned to run away from it. And the beauty of this book is it encourages one to embrace 
those th those messages, those whispers that we can all receive. Um, there there are so many quotes. I'm looking for for one um, to conclude um, with personally before opening up um, the the room to questions. Um, and this is just a partial quote in which you say, "The time is now to live, laugh." and love again it, it really is now mm -hmm. and so i would be delighted to just open up the room to anyone who has questions we have a small intimate group here tonight and uh if i'll just invite everyone up and if you'd like to come up and ask um, the author of the evening a question you can if you want to um, you're a very important part of the audience as a listener if you'd like to remain in the audience you can as well and um, my name again is Mark Hilton Plummer. I'm the founder of 11th Hour Publishing and Soul Adventures Costa Rica. And it's been an absolute delight to host Karen Aline as the first author um, in this series in this club. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna open up the room right now to questions. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Hello, this is Courtney. Hi, Courtney. How are you? I am doing great. I would like to request an autographed copy of the book because oh. I was so, first of all, surprised and I had no clue that it was going to be re-released <laughs> and to find out that there are new chapters. So I am very excited to go through the book for the first time. Um, but I would like to request a signed copy. Is that possible? That's very possible. Thank you very much. Um, if you're in, in, the link for the book is up is pinned at the top. But if you would like a signed copy, what I can do is uh, I'd be happy to purchase the book, sign it, and then we can redirect. <laughs> we can redirect the. Oh, I guess we could do it that way, or redirect. I was going to anyway. We'll work it out. But yes. Okay. <laughs> we could do that. I, and thank you very much. I appreciate that. I do want to say that I know Karen personally, and I don't know how she does all of what she does. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you maintain your demeanor. I don't like you hear how somebody talks about how somebody is so strong and they this and they that, but to know somebody and to see that person do it because you intimately know that person, like you always blow me away at your humility and your ability to love and to be quiet and to live like what you actually write. So I am always impressed and honored to be your friend. So I just wanna say thank you for being an amazing example of what it's like to be that type of person. Uh, well, thank you for uh, calling me friend. I greatly appreciate it. And um, it, it's important. I try. I'm not perfect. I have my days, but I, I, I feel that this was a calling. This is my calling and this is my, it's, it's what I have to do, if that makes sense. So I appreciate you honoring, acknowledging that I'm, I'm walking the talk. <laughs> you are most welcome. I noticed that Sia has come on stage. Sia, do you have a question? And thank you for joining us tonight. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me on stage. Hi, um, it's a question for um, Karen. Um, you mentioned before that you, you know, the incident that happened with your um, son and your daughter-in-law, I'm calling her. Yes. Um, where she was um, abusive and physical with you at some point, yes. and um, you were called out for being, um, because you, you want to rightly wanted so much, um, her to apologize. I thought she should apologize. <laughs> um, and you said that um, your friend called you out. Um, now, it, and, and you mentioned about, you know, not being, judging anyone, yeah. Mm -hmm. But if, I am thinking, I'm, I'm, this question here, when someone has shown you who they are mm -hmm. and it's blatant in front of you um what what is wrong with forming a judgment on that because that's the behavior they have um, um, shown you so is it wrong to form a judgment on the behavior that they've shown you because they've shown you that behavior 
Uh, and that's a great question, Sia, and 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 I'll address it based on in the in the um, concept of what what you asked me as far as my son and and his 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 um, fiance girlfriend long time relationship. They've been to, and they're still together, so they've been together ten years ten years now, and they live together, right? So she is from a different culture. And yes, I truly believe that when people show you who they are, you have to believe them, right? If you remember also in this talk, I said, I had to learn or we have to learn to accept people where they are. And in judgment, we, we, when we judge, we're looking at it in a point of we're making the decision that it's intentional, they should know better, and it's wrong based on our perception of how we were raised and everything. Now, this young lady is a different from a different culture. She's, she's Cuban, Puerto Rican. And I can't say how, quote unquote, she was raised. I also know that in the 10 years, right? And I had to, I had to do this for myself. This is my firstborn son. So I couldn't, I had a choice to make. I could say, you know what? She was rude and disrespectful to me, in my opinion, right? Where I was in that place and time. Or do I want to have her? And is this the person that I wanted for, for my child? Number one, it's not my place to pick his mate for him. But number two, do I want a relationship with him or not? I went two years without interacting with him because he dug his feet in the ground. He's like, this is my woman. This It, it is what it is, right? Mm -hmm. So I could have easily said, you know what? And so there's, so there's, so I could have said, all right, fine. We don't have to talk, whatever. Right. But that's my, my first born in my first blood. You know what I'm saying? That's my, he, that's children. I, I'm saying it's mine, but I have to watch, rephrase that because they're, they're not given to, they're, they're not, not given to us. Right. So I had to rate so I'm like, always, I'm making myself aware of what I'm saying. However, right. To this, to I talked in, so what's important, I had to realize, Karen, what he's doing with his life that might not be choice for me, but it's not my place to make. So where, where is, what is important to Karen? Karen, it was important to me is to have peace, to make sure that I'm giving myself self-care, that I'm treating myself with respect and I'm giving things. So how do I do that? I now live, I mean, he's out of the household, right? She's not, she's not in my home, right, right? So I, I choose when I interact with them, right? It's still his girl, right? So, but I, I, I keep peace. So to keep peace, I'm in my place, I'm in this, this. If I wanna see, hey, what are you guys doing? Why don't we go for dinner? Why don't we do this, right? I accept her for who she is. She's one who speaks her mind. She says how she sees it and I have to accept that. I might, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I have to move forward. So it was wrong of me to say, and I have to say, you know, we grew, we're, you sound like you're from the islands too. Island, how island people are raised. You, if, if it were me coming up, my father, who's a dentist, would have easily knocked the teeth out of my mouth and then put them back in. There's certain <laughs> things, you know what I'm saying? There's certain, but that's yes. how we were raised. Mm -hmm. She wasn't. So who am I to say that, okay, her parents didn't raise her right. They were doing the best that they could based on how they, how they were raised in perfection. So it's not me. It's not right for me to say, I was raised better. We're just raised different, you know. So I have. It's coming to that understanding that it's the differences that we have to accept. Not to say I like it. Now I still don't have to put myself in that place where, or allow myself to start feeling that because I could always say, you know what, time for me to go home. I'm good. Good to see you. I'm gone to put myself in a place where I am in peace. I'm surrounded by people or in that close niche where I'm being lifted up. I don't have to put myself in that, but having a relationship with my children is important to me. So that was the switch. Seeing her, accepting her for who she is. I might not like it still, you know what I'm saying? But it's, 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 I have to move on, operate in a place now where he's 27, she's 26. No, I lie. I'm sorry. I'm forgetting how old my child is. <laughs> They're 26. He's 26. She's 25. One. Nope, 27. He's 27. She's 26. Either way, mm -hmm. he's an adult. 
Mm-hmm. One, he, you know what I'm saying? I'm not paying his bills. He's an adult. It's his choice to choose his partner, not mine. You know what I'm saying? So it's just a matter of like, okay, hey, we can we can chill, we can do whatever, and then I come back to my place. I don't have to be involved in it. She's still the same person who she is, but I don't have to be caught up in the mix. Why are you with her? Why are you this? Da da da. She's not good enough. Cause nothing's gonna. It's not gonna. It's not gonna create anything but more drama. So I just make that choice not to get involved in the drama. Mm-hmm. If he says, you know, whatever, yep, hey, you do you. You know what I'm saying? It's not my he. He lives. He. You know what I'm saying? But it's not my. I can't make the choices for him. I just don't have to involve myself or put myself in a position where I allow her to say something that might be off cuff because I think it's off color. But that is who she is. That's and that's the the main purpose and point of of that is that we have to accept people and for the where they are at that point in time because she didn't feel like she didn't do anything wrong and that's how she was raised. So I tell you what I'm hearing, Karen. I'm I'm hearing <laughs> the voice of someone who's done a lot of work in the release phase. Okay, through mm-hmm. through through other trials. Therefore. When these other little tests come, even though it might sting and burn in the moment, you don't allow it to attach itself to you. You, re, you sometimes it's possible to forgive people in advance. Um, you know, you know who they are. You know where they are. Your expectations of them are reasonable, and so you just keep things moving. <laughs> mm-hmm. And like you said, you manage your engagement with them. Right. Because quite honestly, you have a better use for your energy. Exactly. Thank you for 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 tying that up in a bow for me. <laughs> and it's not easy. See, I'm not saying it's easy because but it's not. But you have to learn as they say in life, pick your battles. You pick your battles. Does it need to be a battle or it can be like, "You know what? Shug it off." Yeah. And I hear it's you. Not important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I understand a bit about him. You know, him being an adult and he has to choose. You know, who he wants to choose and so forth. But um, the concern for that for me would be um, in terms of her now, because say for example, she say if I don't say I'm not quite sure of the circumstances, but if she say um attacked me, then yeah, I attacked you. Um, and she wasn't checked about that. Oh, um, you know, that's how she's been brought up and so forth. Then there's no, um indication that that can't happen again because she wasn't checked or because oh well that's how she's been brought up so we have to just accept her for who right. she is and, and and in general i think in world over there's a there's a there's a there's a thing i'm sure yeah well over that you don't you don't hit someone you know um for stop keep hands to yourself for example right. you know so no, um, and that, that's what I'm concerned about that. Yeah. No, for the clarification. So that's yeah. why, no, she was quote unquote teaser or checked, right? <laughs> she okay. was. And that's why okay. and that's why we didn't speak for two years. You know what I'm saying? Because I was mm-hmm. like, but that was I was in a different point at that time also in my life. Mm-hmm. I was I was I wasn't being an emerging soul because I was, oh, you are wrong. How dare mm-hmm. you? You don't uh-uh, you're a child, this and that. So mm-hmm. I was coming in that place and then I was like, all right, you can't apologize. We can't don't bring her to my house. Don't, I don't want to see you. <laughs> Boom. You know what I'm saying? So that's how I, it, I was and that we were. So my, t- I, we didn't talk literally for mm. two years. For two years. Mm-hmm. And then, like I said, when we approached in the restaurant, we were seated at, across from each other. How, you know what I'm saying? How, how can you imagine? I'll say it that way. Can you imagine you're a mother or, or whoever it is? Someone who was who's your know, family, you mm-hmm. haven't spoken for two years because somebody of some an action someone else did, and you end up in the same restaurant at neighboring tables. Mm. You see, <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. We were mm-hmm. at neighboring tables. I was with my two other kids and my husband at the time, and and they walked in and they sat us right next to each other, and I we hadn't <laughs> spoken in two years. How uncomfortable that mm-hmm. was! It wasn't comfortable. Mm-hmm. And then I and I was still in my my highness. She said, "I'm not talking to her. Are you kidding me? She didn't do what da da da." And I was telling my girlfriend about it, and I was like, "Yep, da da da." And she's like, "Karen, you are so wrong. Excuse me." And then she broke it down, and I was like, "Oh, you're right. You see that?" And so then from then I was like, "All right, 
said, can I come over? Can Lizzie come over? I'm like, oh, well, why don't I come to you? And I would go to their place. So when I was full and had enough, all right, I'm going home now. See you later. You see what I'm saying? So we, I didn't have to relive it, number one. And I didn't have to demand an apology from her because I had, number one, I had to forgive myself for judging her because I didn't have any right to judge her. I, I should have, you know, I looked at the situation. It might not, I didn't like the situation. I didn't, but I could have made, it's how, it's in, in life, it's how you respond versus react. I was reactionary. I wasn't responding. Now I can respond. I can respond by, and she's not the same person. She's matured <laughs> since that happened, you know, and I talk to her. I have a relationship with her in the sense that my they live together my middle son lives with them you know what i'm saying so i had they all had covid hey lizzie thank you for taking care of my boys while you're there you know i appreciate that so i had to you know what i'm saying i couldn't go over there to get myself infected but they had covid but she she had covid too but still she was one provide taking care of them so now it's like okay hey i appreciate you for taking care of kellen and chris because i couldn't do it i appreciate it Oh my God, I thank you so much for saying that means so much to me. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I can, hey, hey, we're having birthday. You want to come over? Sure, I'll come over. But I can leave when I, you know what I'm saying? It's a, hey, I can be involved with them without being involved. And I always can go home. But it's a matter of his choice, his relationship. If he's complaining about her, hey, you know what? Yep, I can listen without giving my input because I have to stay on the neutral. <laughs> but it is it is that it's that it's that acceptance and keeping myself protected, but I can have a relationship with with them and I choose that versus not having one. I know that Sia uh purchased this book as as a member of the community that we have started of um authors and future authors of the Caribbean diaspora. And so Sia, I turn your attention to, I'd like to turn your attention to chapter nine, which is about finding forgiveness. And there is something uh, very poignant in that chapter, many poignant things, but sometimes before we can get to forgiveness, Karen, you mentioned, well, try reconciliation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I really, I really appreciated that because it's not easy to get to forgiveness when you have been uh, really disrespected and, uh, you know, w when it still stings, forgiveness right. just does not seem like an option. But as things cool, we could at least start with reconciliation and you do define what that is um, mm -hmm. on the way to forgiveness. Yes. Yeah, I love it. Sorry. Yeah, I'll have a read of that, Mark, um, when I get a chance. I haven't got to that um, chapter yet, but I will do. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me know what you think, see, if you read that, and, and, and it's important. And the, the most important thing with forgiveness is uh, there was an exercise that I learned when I went to a, a retreat in Boston, the forgiveness exercise, and um, I, I, this was the exercise. So the first thing that you do, this is how you can tell if you've really moved on and where you're at. So the, if, this is a, a, a mindful retreat and you had to pick a person, you were allowed, I should say, you had to pick a person who was alive, who you felt has wronged you. So as I share this, you guys can do this exercise with me in your head. So the instruction was to pick a person who is still living, who you felt has wronged you. Okay, and now you have two minutes to talk about that situation. Okay, and it's timed and you're, you have a partner. So as we did this exercise there, I was like, sheesh. I picked my ex-husband, my first ex-husband. And I was telling my partner about how the time I needed him the most, he left me, he was, a, he cheated. He was, you know, with someone else 30 days after we had buried our son. Two minutes. Okay. It's exercise. The second step of the exercise is now you have to tell, you have two minutes to tell why the person did what they did and how you were, how you were 
how you played a role in it. So I sat there with my partner and I told this instructor, I was like, how did I, what role did I play for him to leave? And she, I have no idea. She's like, Karen, just think about it. You can do it. I said, I'm going to make it up. She's like, for real? I was like, I'm going to make it up. So I said, okay, he told me that if I shopped, he was going to leave and cheat on me. And she's like, he said that? I said, no, he didn't say that. But I cannot, honestly, I'm sitting here and I don't, I have no clue why he did what he, he did or what role did I play. So she's like, okay. So I narrated the story to my partner as far as my ex told me. He said that if I continued, I was a shopaholic. And if I shopped, he was going to leave. And he could, you know, is that. So I made it all up because I truly could not come with anything. The third step in this exercise was you have to now tell the story on how you did, have, how you have done the same thing to somebody else. Mm. When I tell you that the floodgates of tears <laughs> came out of me and I was howling, that was the biggest eye opener for myself. Because as I sat there in judgment of my first husband on how could he leave me, we lost our son, he cheated, et cetera, et cetera. I could not come up with how I impact, how, what role I played in it for him to leave after our son, we buried our son. But when it came to how I've done it to somebody else, the same exact thing, the reason I cried is because the story that I had been carrying for years is when I needed somebody the most, they were going to leave me and I was not supported. But guess what? I hadn't been there for myself. How many times that I need myself or put myself first or speak up for Karen to show up for Karen? I didn't. So that is why I cried. And I was like, I had to come for me to move forward from that and everything else I'd gone through. I had to forgive myself. Because no matter how many relationships I had been in, no matter how much you know, people I felt who I allowed, you know, I allowed myself to be talked down to and the words and their words, I allowed them to create and define who I was. I didn't do that for myself. So if I didn't do it for myself and stick up for myself and create for myself, how could I expect someone else to do it for me? I couldn't have. So that was the beginning of the healing process. So with everybody here listening on the call and everything else, you have to forgive yourself first before you can forgive somebody else. You can't give what you don't have. I noticed that Courtney has uh, joined us again. Courtney, did you want to ask a question? I just wanted to, I guess, affirm Karen in what happened um, with her sitting there, basically with like the method of someone sitting in a chair and you're saying like, this is what happened and you make it up. I'm a hypnotherapist. So I help people heal from issues like that. And one of the things that you have to do is to be able to separate the person from their actions mm -hmm. because people aren't their actions. And in helping people to heal, what we have them do is to say, have you to a greater or lesser degree ever done something like what that person did? And you have to sit there and look at yourself and say, yeah, you know what? I have. And then it's like, well, can you separate yourself from your behavior? Yeah. Are you evil and deserving of punishment? Or were you just doing the best that you could do? No, I'm not evil and deserving of punishment. Okay. Well, can you forgive yourself? Yeah, I can. Well, now that you have this forgiveness for yourself, can you now offer it to that person? That person isn't necessarily sitting in front of you because you're in a session, but that is exactly what you did. And that's why it had the impact that it did. Mm hmm. That's you that is yourself and then mm -hmm. be able to offer that forgiveness to someone else. I tell you, this is a beautiful room. And I know that we could uh, come up with quite a lot of <laughs> questions for Karen w well into the night. <laughs> We're running a little bit over time, so I want to make sure that I um, thank you all for coming and give Karen the last word. But I want to read one little question for which I don't have the answer, and 
I thank Karen for venturing some answers, some options with this book. And the question is, what makes one woman lie down and never get up again? And another woman determined to never give up. I thank you, Karen, for continuing to rise and to keep getting up and staying up and encouraging other people, especially women, to do so. And I thank you um, for gracing this club with this conversation. And I truly would like you to have the last and final word tonight. Well, again, Mark, thank you for allowing me to come and share Emergent Soul um, with everyone here this evening. And um, I'll, I'll share it, I'll leave this way. So um, emergent is defined as the process of coming into being and soul is what gives life to the body. So as you go along on your journeys and wish and to become the expression of life, you are an emergent soul. So keep being kind to yourself. Don't judge yourself, put yourself on the list, value yourself and give love and acceptance of yourself to become that emergent soul. And you also can look back on life's lessons and say, you know what? I'm gonna still keep getting up. I'm gonna keep sharing with others so we can become the community of the nation that we need to be and create communities of people helping one another and raising people up for the future. Thank you for listening to this episode of Emergent Soul Conversations. Join me next time to gain more insights on how to live a life by design and not default. If this was your first time tuning into the show, please make sure and hit the subscribe button below and follow me on Instagram at Emergent Soul. Remember, what happens to you does not define you, your emergent soul.